takes work. All right, that being said, let's get into the Bible this morning. We're continuing our study on modesty. Modesty. And uh, I've gotten several rave reviews from last week. They said, that was pretty good. And I said, well, amen. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And then uh, I said, well, make sure you're here this Sunday because you might not enjoy it so much. Modesty is a hard thing. And it's a hard thing on purpose. And I've tried to lay out, lay out in several ways what modesty is. And it's not just dress. And it doesn't just apply to ladies. And I've, I've hit that pretty good last week. And uh, I'm not going to have you turn anywhere just yet. Uh, I think we're going to be. I think we're going to start off in First uh, Timothy, but I'm not sure. Let me see where we are in review here, and then I'll have you turn your place in the Bible. But just have it there and ready and available. I'll give you some quick review of what we talked about last week and where we stand today, and then I'll move right into uh, some good stuff for you this week. I'm trying to teach you what the Bible says. Is that good or bad? Good. Amen. I'm not trying to teach you what my opinion is. I'm trying to teach you what the Bible says. I'm not trying to give you where I'm comfortable. I'm trying to give you what the Bible says. I'm not trying to put you in a place that is good for me or for the church. I'm trying to put you in a good place with God. And so I'm trying to teach Bible here on these things, on these subjects and topics, because I want you to be in the right place with God. Uh, I'll get it. I'll, let me pray. I'll get into the review, and I'll hit a couple notes that I hit last week, and that way I'll build up to what we're at this week, where, we're, where we are at this week. Father, please help now, I pray. Father, we do need your hand, Lord, on our hearts and in our minds, Lord. I need you to work through me. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you would help me to re- remove myself out of your way. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, rid me of sin, rid me of self. And Father, may I be focused on thee. May you use me as a conduit for your truth, for your word. And Father, I pray that it would help our hearts and minds this morning. Lord, help us to walk out of this hour, Lord, better Christians than when we walked in, Lord, because we're, uh, we're, we are practical in the truth, Lord, and we're applying it to ourselves. And Lord, we're hearing. Uh, your word, and Father, we're just uh, we're, we're 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 just cognizant of it, Lord. We're just aware of what you want to do for us, and so, Father, I pray that there'd be a difference made in this hour. I ask in Jesus' name, Amen. All right, so let me quickly stay with me now as I try to move quick enough so that I can get to some new stuff because I went through a good page and a half of notes last week. We talked about studying modesty. Every male and female must realize it applies to them individually. A lot of times, ladies get a bad rap about modesty. It's not just ladies. Men can be a modest too. Amen. We talked about that. God has an opinion about everything. He has an opinion on female modesty. He has an opinion on male modesty. God has an opinion on it. God has an opinion on everything. And not only does he have an opinion, he clarifies his opinions. The good thing about the word of God right here is it divides asunder. And it'll take truth and it'll point, it'll point blanket. It'll put it right in your face. It'll put it in your lap and it'll, God will clarify it for us. The child of God must keep in mind they are to glorify God in all they do. Christians should constantly be asking themselves, does this please God? Doesn't matter what it is. The the place I'm going to dinner, does it please God? The place I'm moving to, does it please God? The car I'm buying, does it please God? The clothes I'm wearing, does it please God? The conversation I'm having, does it please God? The language I'm using, does it please God? And so you got to be very mindful of that. It's a matter of relationship. We must recall that we can create barriers that prevent God from blessing us. The Bible is very evident. Very evident that we can create barriers between us and God. And there'll be times where we can't hear Him answer prayer. There'll be times where we don't hear Him acknowledge us or we we don't sense His presence. And there's a reason for that. It is a matter of relationship. We looked at, if you wanted to write these down, I won't turn there now, but we looked at 1 Corinthians 10.31. We looked at Colossians 3.17, 2 Corinthians 5.15, 2 Corinthians 6.16, and then we went on several places. Uh, children are to glorify God in what they say. Children are to glorify God where they go, in what they do, and how they look, in what they wear. And I had like five or six subpoints under each of those points. I'm not going to take the time to go over every single one of them. If you want my notes, I will make a copy and give them to you if you'd like to have them. Then we did 1 Corinthians 6.19. We did 1 Thessalonians 5.21. We did 1 Thessalonians 5.22, which says, Abstain from all appearance of evil. Um, talking about appearance, not just appearance in clothes, but appearance in what you're doing. I had an old preacher, uh, Brother Burwell. He wouldn't play with a deck of cards. Wouldn't touch a deck of cards. Why wouldn't he touch a deck of cards? Well, he wouldn't touch a deck of cards because the, the, it was believed that in the old times that the joker and uh, the jack and all those different things were supposed to be a mockery of Christ. And so they refused to use a deck of cards. 
Now, I don't know that all history. He had his conviction about him, and I'm not going to say here it was right or wrong, but I know that he wouldn't touch a deck of cards. He wouldn't be seen with a deck of cards. Amen. He wouldn't be seen with a, a, a handful of dice in his hand. He wouldn't take dice in any game. When you played Monopoly, he made his own spinner. He would not use dice even in Monopoly. The reason was, he said, it's too associated with betting. I don't want anybody to get the false idea. Hey, I'm okay with a standard like that. I'm okay with the fact that you're you're trying to get way ahead of God on the other side of that line. He wouldn't buy Seagram's, Seagram's ginger ale because it represented alcohol. He wouldn't drink Seagram's ginger ale. And he wouldn't buy it. He wouldn't let anybody in the grocery store see, it with it, see him with it in his cart. There are just standards that he would have. And what's it all from? Avoid the appearance of evil. Abstain from the appearance. It doesn't matter if it's evil or not. Stay far away from it. Get on that other side so that you're not even blurring the line. And so, uh, we that we hit that verse pretty good. 1 Thessalonians 5.22. And then we were in Ephesians 5. And we got down talking about modesty is, sim- is not simply a matter of dress or appearance. Modesty is behavior, manner, appearance, or to avoid impropriety or indecency. Let all things be done decently and in order. Again, this is all review. Modesty reveals spirit, attitude, humility, confidence, power, respect, subjection, self-respect, and reverence. Um, I don't, I think, yeah, I think I went through all this. I want to make sure. Modesty is Christ honoring. It's peaceful. It's reassuring. It's holy. It's biblical. And it's protective. Now, let me read those again here, and I'll, I'll kind of pick up here. We are going to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2 here in just a second. But when I make the statement that modesty is not simply a matter of dress, it's behavior, manner, or appearance to avoid impropriety. Remember, I talked about how your yard should look. I talked about how your dress should look. I talked about the conversations in which you should and should not be having. I talked about the appearance in which you're setting off with your countenance, with your, uh, your body language, how you're speaking to those that are around you. That's part of modesty. If you're always angry, if you're always bitter, if you're always upset, that's being immodest. It's impropriety. You're not doing very well for the Lord. You're not giving a good example. You're not giving a good testimony. And the Bible says, the New Testament says that we are an epistle to be read. As people, we are being read by other people. And it is a responsibility of ours to make sure that our appearance is right, to make sure that our behaviors are right, to make sure our mannerisms are right. I don't go around cussing out the guys at the NBA just because I stood in line for an hour and a half. That's not good modesty. I don't go around. Uh, I don't go around burping in ladies' faces. Why? Not very good modesty, right, fellas? I'm aware of my uh, hygiene when I'm in presence, especially of ladies. Why? Because that's good modesty. Ladies, I, I'd be aware of men. I'd be aware of what might be enticing to a man and what's not enticing to a man. What might take a man off the hook from doing something lustful? And so, just being mindful of those different things of modesty is so much more than just what you're wearing. So modesty is Christ honoring, it's peaceful, it's reassuring, it's holy, it's biblical, and it's protective. Modesty is not only in appearance, but also in countenance, conversation, and behavior. Again, this is review. And then a person is to be modest in order to be Christ honoring. This is where I left off. A person is to be modest in order to be Christ honoring. What does that mean? In order for me to magnify my Savior in the best way possible, I have to live modestly. The preacher ought not be driving Lamborghinis. That doesn't represent God very well. The preacher ought not have a two and a half trillion dollar yacht. Why? It's not very modest. I ought not be coming in a neon orange suit coat on Sundays. Unless there's a special occasion like Hunter Sunday or something like that. But for the most part, it's not flamboyant. It's not in your face. It's modest. It's it's to where you almost don't even recognize what I was wearing that day. Why? Because my job to be Christ honoring is to be modest. I'm not here to get attention. I'm, you, you ought not be here to get attention. And we're going to get into that here in just a second. But a person is to be modest in order to be Christ honoring. Let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Very famous verse on modesty. One of the main verses on modesty. There are others. We may look at a few more. Matter of fact, we will look at a few more. I'm going to take you to several passages this morning if time allows. I got, I got good time right now. 
I think you'll enjoy this. I always loved, I always thrilled at, I always enjoyed learning Bible. Because I don't know if you're anything like I am, but for so long I heard these things, but I didn't know these things. For so long, as I would come to church, I had had an opinion, or I had a thought about something, but I really wanted to know what my Creator thought about it. If, if He was my Maker, if He was the one that put me here, I wanted to know His opinions. Why? He made me. He knows how this operation works best, right? He knows how my mind works best, my spirit works best. He knows, he knows physically how I work best. He knows what's best for me. And so I wanted what God had to say for me. And I, I would soak it up quite often. And there are times, there are times you say, well, wait a minute, hold on. I don't know if that's, you know, in context or whatever the case. Do your homework. Do your homework. Look at your Bible. Take it home. Study it. Study it for yourself. Don't just take one person's word for it. But if it's in the Bible, you take that word for it right there. This is our final authority. 1 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse 9. In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair, or gold, or pearls, or costly array. Right here, Timothy's talking about this matter of prayer. The Bible says, pray without what? Ceasing. It says pray without ceasing. Should we be in prayer at all times? The Bible tells us to be in prayer at all times. The Bible tells us to be in prayer constantly. Okay? Well, this is talking about a matter of prayer. When a woman goes before the Lord in prayer. Well, we're to be praying without ceasing. So that would mean that we are, and we are to be this way on a normal basis. Let's look at the verse here. In like manner also that women adorn themselves. That word adorn in the Greek and in the Hebrew, I thought about putting it up on the screen this morning to show you the Greek and the Hebrew, but I didn't want to bore you and then I wasn't able to transfer it to the live stream, so I didn't go through all that. So you're going to have to trust me on the Greek and the Hebrew and look it up for yourself. This word adored means to place in proper order and to bring beauty. Adorn means to place in proper order and bring beauty. Okay? So, in like manner also that women place in proper order to bring beauty to themselves in what? Modest apparel. What is modest? The Greek word for modest comes from the Greek word cosmos. If I were to say cosmos, you have something that you would wear quite often called a costume. Cosmos, costume, something in which you put on. This matter of modest costume is a matter of orderly covering. This means orderly covering. It means on purpose. It means arranged. It means put in place. Okay? So we have adorned to place in proper order. We have modest, which means a matter of orderly covering. That word covering is important. Okay? Now let's look at the rest of it. In modest apparel. You and I know apparel to be what you buy at the store. I'm going to put on apparel. I'm going to buy a suit. I'm going to buy some socks. I'm going to buy some jeans. I'm going to buy a dress. That's my apparel. Remember, words from the Bible ain't the same as words today. So let me show you what this word apparel means. This is going to blow your mind. Because this word apparel has nothing to do with what you and I know as apparel. This word apparel literally means, if you have the Greek and the Hebrew, I have a text. I can let you use my app on my phone if you want to look up the Greek and the Hebrew. But this is the Greek and Hebrew of what it means for apparel. It means to drape and to send down in a draping fashion. To drape and to send down in a draping fashion. So the word apparel is not just a matter of a piece of clothing. It's not just a matter of a garment. There is a certain look that the garment ought to have. Okay? Again, I'm just teaching Bible this morning. I'm showing you what Scripture said. All right? Now, let's look at the rest of it. With shamefacedness. Shamefacedness is pretty much what you think it might be. But here is why it's so particular. Because when you look up the Greek and the Hebrew, the word shamefacedness means with bashfulness toward men. Bashfulness toward men. You know, if there's anything that ladies are missing today, it's blush. And I'm not talking about the makeup. You know, there's, there's not much that embarrasses a man or a woman anymore. But there should be. If I was godly, if I was trying to be Christ-honoring with my life, there are some things and there are some situations that just aren't right for a, a child of God, whether male or female, to be in. Are you with me? Are you following me? 
shamefacedness is with bashfulness toward men. Here's the rest of it. In awe or reverence of God and man. God is telling us, it's telling us in the scripture right here, that women ought to have shamefacedness about what they're putting on and about what they're presenting. There should be something from time to time that embarrasses us and how we act, how we talk, how we look. Men and women. Next, look at this word sobriety. So we have in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. What is sobriety? Sobriety means soundness of mind and peacefully. Soundness of mind and peacefully. So the Bible tells us in like manner that women place orderly on themselves a orderly covering to drape, to send down in draping fashion with bashfulness toward men and soundness of mind. Ladies, how often if you put on something and you're worried about it, that should be a dead giveaway that it's not a good thing to wear. If, if I have to put something on and I'm nervous about how I'm going to handle myself in it, whether it be too short, whether it be too low cut, whether it be too tight, if I've got to consider it too much, then it's not, very, it's not in sobriety, is it? I'm not having a peace of mind about it. You may have a peace of mind in your flesh, but do you have a peace of mind in your spirit? You may have a peace of mind and say, well, I'm comfortable with it because. Well, if you're comfortable with it, is God comfortable with it? Because that's what I ought to be, is Christ honoring as a Christian. Then let's look at it says, and not with broided hair. That means plated, twined, braided. But it's not referring to avoid braiding. This isn't referencing that a lady ought not braid her hair doesn't say anything about not braiding your hair. What it means is your hair ought not be grabbing attention from everyone else around you. Somebody ought not be sitting there and saying, do you see all the jewels? Do you see all the things that she has in her head right there? No, because as a Christian, we're not supposed to be drawing attention to ourselves. We're supposed to be placing attention to our Savior. And so this word braided hair is not saying don't braid your hair. It means don't make it so fancy to where it's capturing attention. You know, back in the uh, old Wild Wild West, you know, them ladies had them big poofy dresses, and they had them hairs, and they had their pins, and they had all these different things, and their hair stuck out. Their, ha their hair was just as tall as their dress was low. I mean, you know, they, they doubled their size because of their hair and because of their dress. Well, that's what it's talking about. Don't be putting so much stuff all over you that you're capturing attention for yourself. God doesn't want us to have attention. We should be modest in our attention. I'm, I'm going somewhere. Hang on with me. A parent should never draw attention away from God. Then the Bible says, costly array. What on earth is costly array? That means fancy clothing, shiny, flamboyant, attention grabbing. Costly array means fancy clothing, shiny, flamboyant, and attention grabbing. That being said, let's look at opinions on modesty in the area of clothing and dress throughout the Bible. Like I said, it's in several different places, not just here in 1 Timothy. So that we see what modest apparel is, we see what God's opinion is on that matter. Then let's take the Bible and go to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. It's important to understand God's opinions. Remember, we can create barriers between God and us, that means our prayers might not be answered or heard. That means our blessings might not fall as free-flowing as they ought to. That means there is a distance between God and myself that ought not be there. I don't want barriers between God and myself. So let's look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. Familiar story. Genesis 3, 7, And the eyes of them both were opened, Talking about Adam and Eve, obviously, when they had fallen in the fruit. And they knew that they were naked. And what did they do right away? They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves what? Aprons. Okay, look at verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was what? Naked and did what? Hid myself. 
All right, now let's look at verse 21. Verse 21, same passage. Unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make what? Coats of skins. Boy, isn't that familiar. Boy, what is that all about? Well, here's Adam and Eve. We must first realize that clothing and coverings have been important to God since Adam and Eve. That's what we got to understand. We have to understand as Christians in 2020, it is just as important today as it was in Adam and Eve what a person puts on. He thought it important enough. Fig leaves weren't enough. He put on coats of skins, and the Bible calls them aprons. All right? He did not leave them in fig leaves. They weren't enough. He clothed them to wrap them, cover them, also showing the necessity of the blood as covering for our sin. So it's twofold here. First of all, it shows that the blood is necessary for salvation. Second of all, it shows that God has an opinion and He cares about what a person does or does not wear. Okay? Lest you say, well, I don't know about all that. Okay, take your Bible to Genesis 35. Genesis 35 and verse 2. Let's look at the Bible in verse 2. Then Jacob said unto his household, and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your what? Garments. Know that it matters to God what his children wear. It matters to God what his children wear. Take your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and you'll want to find verse 2. This is a verse I referenced earlier. 2 Corinthians 3, 2 says, Ye are our epistle written in our hearts. Known and what? What's it say? Read of all men. Just as a sad countenance reveals a problem, clothes reveal different things. If I looked at your face, if I saw your facial expressions, if I looked at your eye contact, I know whether you're engaged or not. I know when a person's not engaging at all in the church service, A, they don't want to they don't want to know what I have to hear. B, they're just here because they have to be. C, they can't wait until I'm get I get done. But a person is engaging, they're interested. Maybe they're trying to just simply be respectful, or maybe they're really trying to learn. A preacher can gauge a lot from eye contact. You know what else? Uh, any person at the grocery store or my neighborhood or my workplace can gauge your spirit by your face, by your body language. And by what you wear. By what you wear. Clothes reveal rebellion, self-esteem, a desire for attention and approval. And clothes are more than just covering for the body. They represent emotions and opinions. You know that to be true. If I were to say goth, what does that mean to you? You automatically think of somebody wearing a whole bunch of black. They got a whole lot of piercings. Their hair may be dark. If I say that was a goth looking person you are going to reference that to a certain being. If I say they, it was a harlot, you are now going to get things in your mind of what a harlot looks like. If I said it's a baseball player, you are now going to get in your mind what a baseball player is wearing. Why? It reveals. You want to go to a place, and how many of you go to a place to where it's not organized, it's not orderly, it, it, the, the, the place is a wreck, it's dirty, If I'm talking about a place to eat. If I wanted to go to a place to eat and I walked in and everybody was wearing cut off jeans and they had holes in their shirts and their hat was all messed up. They looked like they hadn't combed their hair in three weeks. They looked like they hadn't brushed their teeth in a month and a half. They had flip flops and stinky feet and the kitchen was all a mess and there was, there was grease and grime all over the countertop and all over the, and all over the stove and they had roaches crawling across the floor. You're going to walk in and you're going to get an opinion right away. And you're going to make a decision, do I want to eat here or do I not? Most of you would say no. Some of you are crazy enough to say, cook me up a burger. <laughs> right? But there's an appearance there. There's an evaluation being made. There's an assessment being had off of the appearance of a place. The same is about a Christian. There's an assessment being made. There's an evaluation being done. There's an epistle being read. 
because of our appearance. And we have to understand that as Christians. Take your Bible over to Isaiah 47. You're going to like this. Isaiah 47. How many times have you heard the word nakedness? How many of you know what nakedness is? And that's rhetorical. I want you to ask yourself. If I were to say naked, most people today are thinking totally cloth, uh, clothless. Clothless. If I said, okay, nakedness in the Bible means bare. No. Nakedness in the Bible does not mean bare. I'm going to show you. Isaiah 47. Verse 1. Isaiah 47 and verse 1. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground. There is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Does that sound pretty harsh? Are you, are you grasping what's being said right here? They're saying to Babylon, it's judgment against Babylon right here. It says, come down and sit in the dust. Is that a comfortable place to sit? Is that a proper place to sit? Is that a place you want to be found sitting? Sit in the dust. Sit on the ground, it says. O virgin daughter of Babylon, sit on the ground. There is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. So there is an impression being made. There is an opinion right here in verse 1 that says you're going to sit in a place that is not very respectful and it's not very honoring and you are not getting a throne. You are going to sit in the dust. You are going to sit on the ground and you're no longer going to be known as tender or delicate. Verse 2. Take the millstones and grind meal, uncover thy locks, talking about hair, make bare the leg, uncover the thigh, pass over the rivers. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. What is it talking about? Not only is it judgmental in verse 1 saying that you are not going to be tender, you are not going to be delicate, you are not going to be in a good way. Verse 2. Take millstones and grind meal, uncover thy locks, make bare the leg, uncover the thigh, pass over the rivers. Verse 3, thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. Verse 4, or excuse me, the rest of verse 3. I will take vengeance and I will not meet thee as a man. As for our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts is his name, the Holy One of Israel. Sit thou silent and get thee into darkness. O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called the Lady of Kingdoms. There was a day and age where the word Lady was highly referenced. The word Lady was highly referenced, highly respected. Now there's a mass label of Lady. But biblically speaking, there's a lot of folks that don't meet the category. Uh, there used to be a time, fellas, men, that if we heard another man cuss in front of our lady, we would say something, stand up, if not punch him in the jaw. Because we didn't want to disrespect our ladies. A man ought to open a door for a lady. Why? It's respectful. It, it's knowledgeable. It, it, it's, it, it's showing a sense of appreciation. But that's fallen away these days. But it should be a different way. The word lady carries some respect. The word lady is highly referenced in the Bible. Isaiah is referencing Babylon to a pure female. He says you are no longer pure or innocent. Nakedness in the Bible is simply a revealing of the leg and thigh. It's right there in verse 2 and verse 3. He says uncover the thigh. Not in a good way, in a bad way. Uncover the thigh, pass over the rivers, thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. In God's eyes, this is the Lord speaking about Babylon, in God's eyes, the thigh is nakedness for men and women. So, what does that mean, preacher? A man can't wear shorts? No, doesn't mean a man can't wear shorts, but them shorts better cover the thigh. In God's eyes. Not talking about mine. I'm not talking about yours. I'm not talking about your neighbors. I'm not talking about your moms and dads. I'm not talking about your boss. I'm talking about in God's eyes. What does that mean, preacher? I'm a lady. It means that whatever you wear should cover your thigh. Because in God's eyes, 
that's nakedness. And he calls it impure. He calls it unclean. He says it takes away innocence. Nakedness brings shame and dishonor, not honor. Nakedness brings shame and dishonor, not honor. It is dishonorable for a woman to reveal herself. Um, how often sometimes, uh, as the way it should be, you, you catch a lady in a certain position uh, and not improper, but just maybe just like a borderline improper. Like uh, maybe they were like taking their shoes off or something and they didn't want a, some guy to be around and they, they try to cover themselves up real quick and they try to just make sure that they're all, they're all set and squared away and make sure they're not revealing anything. That's good. But it ought not be that tight. It ought, it ought not be that tight of a situation. Let's take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 22. Take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 22. Again, just showing you some Bible this morning. I'm not here to judge what you do or what you don't do. I'm here to give you scripture. Deuteronomy 22 and verse 5. A very common verse, especially when it comes to this type of discussion. Deuteronomy 22, 5. This is pretty hard for a lot of people to grasp. This is one of them hard verses right here. So bear with me here. Don't get mad at the preacher. Go home and gripe to God if you want. But let's look at what the Bible says in Deuteronomy 22, 5. Uh, here, you know, it's also to recall, it's important to recall this. God hasn't changed. God hasn't changed. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God's opinions back when he first created man are the same opinions he carries today. And we've got to understand that. Whether it's Old Testament or New Testament. New Testament doesn't eliminate God's preferences. It may have changed the law because now the law is based off of Christ. It's no longer based off of morals. That's different. But commandments, the Ten Commandments still apply. Do they not? Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Right? Thou shalt not create false witness. Bear false witness. Those all apply. Well, then this still applies. Look at Deuteronomy 22, 5. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Man, that is a hard verse. You know what abomination means in the Bible? Abomination means God pukes at it. It is that disgusting. Pride is an abomination to God. Lying is an abomination to God. What else is an abomination to God? When a woman wears that which a man should wear, and a man wears that which a woman should wear. It's very obvious in Scripture. Men ought not be walking around in dresses. Why? Because it's not godly. All that the, the fashion and that rave about kilts and all these different men wearing their kilts and they're, they're okay with it. God's not okay with it. There's, we'll get into all that at some point. The Lord wants separation between His creations. Now, this is this year, I'm going to spend a minute on this here. Uh, I might, I'm going to have to finish up here in just a second. But we have to understand, I'll pick back up here on this verse next week. The Lord wants separation between His creation. God, listen here now, God vomits at unisex. He ain't happy about it. God doesn't like unisex. He doesn't like when we're doing the same thing. He doesn't like when a man looks like a woman and a woman looks like a man, and He doesn't like it when that line gets blurred. He doesn't like it. He made us male and female. He made us separate for a reason. So the proper way to be Christ honoring is to have division between the two. It is abhorring to him the unisex. This is also referring to jewelry, garments, occupations, hair, roles, etc. There is a difference to God on what the role of a man ought to be and the role of a woman ought to be. Now it's important to understand it does not take away any validity or, uh, or, or respect of a lady or man. God has never demeaned women. He has always placed them on a higher pedestal, not a lower pedestal. And a man ought to respect his wife, and a man ought to give reverence to his wife, and a man ought to have his home in such a manner where he's a leader, not a dictator. There should never be a time where a man is bossing his wife around. That's not biblical either. And there should never be a time where a woman feels like she's insuperior to a man. That's not true either. You are co-equals. Now, there are different roles to play. There are different responsibilities. But you are equal. 
You're not above the man except the man is the head of the house. Biblically speaking, the man is the head of the house. And so that being said, he chooses disparity for his creations. When a man gets dressed, he ought to get to dress for work. When a woman gets dressed, she ought to get dressed for reverencing her husband and her Savior. That's the roles to play. The woman represents God and represents her husband. And if she's drawing more attention to herself than God, not very good. Not very good. This is a part of modesty. We're going to pick back up there next week. I'll leave you with this last point on that. Women's purpose of clothing is to show submission and modesty. Arabians still dress the sexes differently today. You know that to be true. You can go over into the Middle East and most places still to this day dress their men and women separately. Why? Because God does have a preference. They may have their God mistaken. They may have which God they're serving wrong. But at the same time, those principles are all based off of this one right here. God still has an opinion on it. And so, I hope you don't get too mad at me today. It's not me. I'm showing you Bible, okay? The preacher loves you. I want to hug you all and I want to say I'm so sorry that God said that, but I can't. It's, it's what God said. I've got to teach the Bible. That being said, there's more to come next week. I know last week was a lot more fun. This week was a lot more. Okay, preacher, get off it. Uh, next week should start to balance those two out just a little bit, so hang tight with me next week. There's still more to come on this, and uh, I hope you're learning something. And hey, I'll tell you this. It's a matter of growth in all of us. It's a matter of growth in all of us. Um, there is a point in time in my life and, and still some things that I still have to grow in. But we should be working towards that. We should be growing. We shouldn't be the same yesterday as we shouldn't be the same today as we were yesterday. Let's pray. We'll get ready for the morning service. And uh